Thanks to the organizers for having me and for all the work. I know that organizing these conferences is a ton um, and not always terribly rewarding. And, um, so thank you. It's cool to be here. Um, so I'm going to go over a bunch of material that we've seen a million times. Um, but, you know, I'll just do it without apologies from here on out. So, on Kant's telling, the Enlightenment motto is to have courage to make use of your own understanding. This essay, an answer to the question, what is Enlightenment, can convey the impression that each person needs to grow up and learn to use his or her reason independently, even in domains where she is not expert. Famous quote that we've seen a bunch of times, it's comfortable to be a minor if I have a book that understands for me, a spiritual advisor who has a conscience for me, a doctor uh, who decides upon a regimen for me, and so forth, I need not trouble myself at all. So in the groundwork, Kant tells us that the human person is subject only to laws given by himself, but still universal, and is bound in actuality to act in conformity only with his own will. Kant's ethics of autonomy conveys the impression that we need not take orders from others, that we are sovereigns in the ethical, moral domain. As human beings, Kant is clear in his writings on right that we are innately equal to one another, in the specific sense that no one may be bound by others to more than one can in turn bind them. And in the domain of right, the status is equal stems from our right to be independent from constraint by another's will. Kant writes freedom, independence from another's necessitating power of choice, insofar as it can coexist with the freedom of every other in accordance with the universal law is the only right belonging to every person by virtue of her humanity. I think these passages paint a familiar picture, one that many people over the course of the last two days have been calling into question, uh, of human beings as hyper-individualist autonomous equals um, that need not uh, take much from uh, our social world and other people around us. I also think that this picture, or at least the caricature of this picture, um, might form certain expectations in us about other things that a person like Kant might hold. For example, that deference to others in matters of thought and action is inappropriate, involving, after all, a famous failure to think for oneself. Uh, that coercive paternalism, hard or soft, is unjust. After all, it involves constraining someone to act when their independence from such constraint would not compromise anyone else's independence. And that democratic procedures are in principle requirements of political legitimacy. Any other arrangement, after all, seems to allow asymmetries in binding power, and so is repugnant with our innate right to equality. These positions aren't equally complementary with alternative views of the individuals, uh, of the individual views that we might associate with people like Raz uh, and Rousseau. Um, I think Rousseau uh, don't hang too much on that claim. There are other contemporary figures you might draw on but I like uh, 18th century figures. Um, <laughs> on this family of views, to be autonomous uh, is a, a thing that we should care about, but the way that we ought to understand that in, is in terms of our ability to act upon and carry, uh, carry out uh, our rational interests. But if that's what it is to act autonomously, then there can really be no principled reason against deference. If individuals have interests in believing the truth, avoiding error, and are likely to get it wrong if they're left to their own devices, then deference is wholly appropriate and required. Likewise, there's no principled reason grounded in autonomy to prefer democratic institutions, particularly uh, if individuals would in fact vote for policies that cut against their interests, um, then um, empowering them to make these decisions might represent a net loss to their autonomy. And similarly with paternalism, if individuals have an interest in welfare, um, and they would do worse by the lights of that interest by choosing for themselves, paternalistic policies may be authoritative for them. Uh, policies that take some options off the table might not just make them better off, but also might improve their freedom and make them more autonomous. Um, this view, this is a car I bought, in fact, on the market. Uh, it's not this particular one, it's the type. Uh, is more plausible, I think, than it might seem when it's stated abstractly. Um, the interest-based view appears better uh, positioned to be able to account for the respects in which something like laws against uh, false advertising, 
um, enhance rather than compromise autonomy. A simple example, you want to buy a car for me, suppose it's this car that I bought, which was in fact a bad car. Uh, you believe that having the car I am selling will help you get to work faster than the bike you currently use. I'm in possession of information which makes this false. The car, in fact, has a bad transmission. In fact, the car had a bad transmission. Uh, it's going to fail in a couple of weeks. I can seal this information for you, or at least I'm not forthcoming with it, and, and you, we can flip the deal. A week later, car fails. Um, in one scenario, that's the end of the story. Buyer beware. Know who you're dealing with. In another, this state allows me to recover my money from you on threat of punishment. In doing this, the intuition motivating this alternative conception goes, uh, doesn't the state realize through a soft paternalistic measure uh, my autonomy rather than restricting it? And again, I think um, Kant can seem pretty expressly to say otherwise. So he says in the Metaphysics of Morals, each person has an innate right of merely communicating his thoughts to others telling or promising them something, whether what he says is true and sincere, or untrue and insincere. For it is entirely up to them what they, whether they want to believe him or not. In other words, buy my car, give me the money, uh, you believe me that everything's in good working order, too bad. Okay, so um, in any case, um, I think it's important to get clear on the real implications of Kant's view before we start thinking too hard about reductio ad absurdum arguments to it. And so in the longer version of this paper, which I described to Kevin as a sprawling nightmare in an email, uh, takes on all of these claims. The one that I'm gonna focus on today is just this first claim about deference. Um, I wanna argue that Kant's position does not imply a blanket prohibition on deference, um, that his notions of enlightenment and autonomy allow for deference to better informed others in a range of cases, and I'm going to do this through a series of steps. I'll begin by clarifying the notion of deference and distinguishing between types of deference. I'll identify the standard view, um, which I'll identify shortly, so I won't spend time now telling you what it is. I'll argue that the Kantian view is compatible with the standard view, or what I take to be the received view on the appropriateness of deference and under which conditions it's appropriate. Um, that the Kantian view has at least some kind of explanation for a datum central to the standard view, explaining, in other words, why certain kinds of deference are uh, seen to be fishy, while other kinds of deference seem to be fine and above board and required. And then I'll remind us that even so qualified, the Kantian view remains in competition with this rival view I just described. Um, it's a view that's even friendlier to deference because it recommends epistemic paternalism in conditions where removing some kinds of information from a person's evidence space um, will improve their ability to defer and their willingness to defer to appropriate experts. Um, and then I'll just very briefly say a few reasons why I still think that we should accept the Kantian version and not this rival version. Okay, so I'll begin with a definition and a few distinctions. First, I'll say that A defers to B about X when A adopts as her own B's judgment on X, either without forming a judgment of her own or against the judgment she forms on her own. Um, following convention, I'll say that A's deference to B is moral deference when she bases her belief about some ethical matter on B's say-so. By contrast, I'm not following the convention quite because I don't think there's a convention on this point. I'll say, without being satisfied in saying, that A's deference to B is rational, where rational is not a success term, but just a way of carving up uh, fields of inquiry, uh, when she bases her belief about a matter of scientific or philosophical significance on B's say-so. Could be theoretical. Um, I'm open to other options. But following convention, in any case, I'll say that A's deference to B is pure if the judgment on which it is based is not empirical or descriptive, or derived from an empirical or descriptive judgment. And then I'll say impure deference bases itself on judgments which are empirical or descriptive. Um, that's abstract, let's make it concrete. So pure moral deference, uh, boxing match between Mill and Kant in the heart of Jane. Jane wonders whether to accept utilitarianism or Kantianism, knowing that Belinda is a moral exemplar who is incidentally well-trained in moral theory, 
And knowing further that Belinda accepts utilitarianism, Jane accepts utilitarianism for just this reason, despite the fact that she finds the view implausible and doubts very much that she would accept it if left to her own devices. Impure deference. Well, you can't see the picture. It's a picture of a bunch of chickens and a guy in overalls in the middle of the chickens in a factory farm. That's because Jalen is wondering whether factory farming harms animals. He believes that if it does harm animals above, above a thir certain threshold, eating meat is wrong. He talks to Al, who's ha had work experience at a factory farm, and was so disturbed by what he saw that he ceased consuming animal products from such farms on the basis of his experience. He informs Jalen of this fact. Without seeking further information about factory farms, Jalen accepts that factory farming does in fact harm animals and accept, adopts the belief that it is wrong. So moral deference, but the proposition to throw out is this descriptive claim. Um, there's a thick norm, uh, there's a thick con concept in that idea of farming, which you might think makes this pure. Um, there are other cases that I could present that don't use thick concepts, so I don't think you should let that distract you. Um, here's another case. Georgios is wondering whether there's a god. Without familiarizing himself with any of the arguments for or against the existence of a di divine deity, he asks Joe, who has a PhD in the philosophy of religion, whether Joe is a believer. Joe tells him that he is not. Georgios, in deference to Joe, decides that he isn't either. Impure rational deference, again, not totally satisfied with the terminology there. Samantha thinks that if there is a compelling physical explanation for the origin of the universe, then there is likely to be no God. Juan, a physicist, tells her about the Big Bang, which she doesn't understand. He says that it offers a sufficient naturalistic explanation for the universe's origin. Samantha defers to him and adopts the belief that there is such an explanation and that the universe did not have an intelligent creator um, by applying this sort of modus ponens rule. In each case, an agent arrives at a judgment by deferring to some other. In what are typically referred to as pure cases of deference, agents defer to others that they regard as having merely ethical, rational, or philosophical knowledge that they lack. In impure cases, judgments on those matters are informed, uh, uh, are formed before consulting the relevant expert, who in turn possesses some empirical knowledge that's relevant to the deciding the question in which they're actually interested. Right? Um, the standard view, roughly, although there are dissenters, apologies in particular to David Enoch, um, is that impure deference is okay, maybe it's even required, um, it's a good way of conducting yourself an inquiry, even if some of those stylized cases um, include details that make you think that the uh, subjects are lazy, they can be changed to avoid those, that sense. Whereas pure deference is suspect or fishy. Um, so, um, one plausible explanation for the standard view uh, concerns the putative clear, a lack of clear ways of identifying philosophical or moral experts. There's a literature on that. Um, by contrast, identifying experts in impure cases is not nearly so difficult, right? They often wear lab coats or have direct experiences backing up their testimony. Um, another explanation is that in pure cases, the relevant kind of knowledge requires some kind of understanding. There's an internalist condition. Uh, whereas uh, in empirical matters, not, uh, knowledge really doesn't have such a condition uh, attached to it. Um, so basically the standard view is that deference is appropriate, perhaps even required in cases where you lack knowledge and have reason to believe that some other person has such knowledge. What is typically thought in need of explanation is our strong sense that pure deference, moral or philosophical, is somehow inappropriate. Kant's views on intellectual autonomy and enlightenment offer a sort of natural explanation of the problem of pure deference. Intellectual maturity in matters like these involves thinking for yourself about important matters about how to orient yourself in your world. Um, what it is to have knowledge in pure domains is to possess a kind of understanding that can't be had from just picking out attractive judgments where you find them from others. But this is a strong medicine if you take Kant's view seriously as it's actually written, because it secures the fishiness of pure deference by also casting aspersions on impure uh, cases of deference. So again, um, 
we have this quote from the Enlightenment essay that suggests even in domains where there is clear expertise on empirical matters like medicine, right, you shouldn't just do what the doctor says. That um, strikes me as uh, potentially ruling out even impure difference. So I don't also think that this view is, uh, this passage is just exuberance excited by the subject matter of enlightenment or the audience that Kant anticipated getting. I think in notes from various logic lectures, you get a very similar set of ideas. For example, in Blomberg Logic, Kant writes that of all the things that can harm and be opposed to the philosophical spirit, the spirit of imitation is always the worst. Imitation is the cultivation of one's understanding, his will, indeed, of his choice, according to the example of others. If, namely, one is not skilled in thinking for oneself, then one takes refuge in others and copies from them completely. But I think it's to overread this passage that I just read and also the passage that's on the slide uh, to suggest that they tell against impure deference of the sort that so many think is required. I do think that it probably tells against something like unthinking or lazy deference. So let's distinguish then between allowing a book on some topic to understand for you in the kind of active reading that we know Kant himself spent a great deal of time engaged in, writing detailed notes in his margins. In the one case, the bad case, you suck up the book's content like a sponge. If you had going in a belief or an inclination on some topic that the book treats, you replace it immediately with the author's judgment on the matter. Though some of the arguments seem to you questionable, no matter. The point of reading the book in the first place was to form beliefs on its topic, and deference to the author is the shortest path to your goal. Here there's no effort to discover the writer's track record, no thought about one's epistemic duties, no reflection on the evidence presented at all. The mere existence of the putative expert is an excuse not to think about any of these matters. It is an excuse to keep oneself moving forward on life's conveyor belt without thorough examination, and one wonders, among other things, whether such a life is uh, worth living. But in the other case, you pick up the book and you scrutinize it. When the author says something that you might not believe or agree with, you think about her evidence for the claim. If you don't understand the evidence and the author has specialized knowledge in the relevant domain, you suspend your disbelief and you defer. When you do so, you do so from the recognition that you might be out of your depth, um, from the recognition that expert testimony is a reliable ground for belief formation. Well, the first approach, I think, is a paradigmatically immature way of approaching one's actual intellectual life. It's hard for me, anyway, to see that anyone could have much of a problem with the second. One judgment that I can make for myself is that it is best to trust those who have direct experience or certain kinds of expertise. There's a difference, perhaps often a subtle difference, between offloading your thinking to a book or a speaker uh, and allowing your judgments to be grounded in the best work that others are doing. But to treat one's intellectual life as a fad-oriented kind of thing, where you're always jumping on the latest bandwagon, that seems like a good criticism of a way of conducting one's intellectual life. And I think there's actually evidence that this is really the kind of thing that Kant is talking about uh, in some of these passages. So when he talks about the what goes wrong when we base our takings to be true on custom or imitation, he notes, no reflection at all really occurs here then, but rather one accepts at once what others have maintained before us without reflecting oneself on whether it is rational to accept it. To clothe oneself fashionably it is, is laudable and good, for it is more acceptable and better to be a fool in fashion than out of it. But to judge, to infer, to think, to write as it were in accordance with the fashion is always silly and proof of no reflection at all. At the same time, though adopting pro-attitudes to certain propositions on the basis of custom and by imitating the beliefs of others is often reflective of vice, Kant's actually kind of careful to deny that these sorts of grounds serve no important function for people. Indeed, Kant notes that there are many, many who do not have enough capacity and enough strength of mind to investigate everything according to the laws of the understanding and of reason, and to examine it with proper reflection. He continues that to deny that it's appropriate for such persons in such circumstances uh, to believe through custom or imitation would amount to robbing them of, quote, very good cognitions without sufficient reason. 
now we can ask, I think, what's wrong with logical egoism, another position that we've found here. The logical egoist, Kant, believe, uh, Kant says, believes that the judgments are up of others are totally dispensable for him, um, for the use of his own reason and for the cognition of the truth. By succumbing to logical egoism, persons deprive themselves not only of an important touchstone of truth, they also fail, as we will shortly see, to benefit from others' testimony when it is available. So I think Axel has done a really good job um, showing that Kant has a sophisticated account of testimony. I have, in conversation with Joseph, realized that maybe I think um, that it is a reductivist account, or a reductionist account, but in any case, that's a, a longer discussion. Importantly, on the account of testimony that Gilford develops, what others say should be taken no less seriously than what we ourselves directly experience. Taking other people at their word in some way is an important component of trust without which we would be worse off, epistemically speaking, I think. It is also grounds of a kind of certainty and we would be foolish to dispense with it. Now, I think it's important, so if that's right, both logical egoism, with, which rejects all testimony and deference, even in pure deference, and taking to be true on grounds of imitation where this can be avoided, are vices. The one is a vice because it evinces intellectual arrogance and fails to notice that we need an epistemic community in order to approximate the truth and to understand our world. The other is a vice because the person who succumbs to it advocates his rational vocation, judging, quote, nothing for himself, thereby elevating others above oneself and trusting nothing to himself. These are both, for Kant, a kind of intellectual arrogance uh, and laziness. Sorry. They're a kind of laziness, they're not a kind of arrogance. When he says that we can take others' testimony um, seriously, as seriously as we take our own experience, Kant distinguishes between two kinds of certainty, empirical certainty and rational certainty. Rational certainty encompasses logical and moral issues or practical issues. Where, <clears throat> and he's clear throughout these passages that um, empirical certainty can come from testimony, but moral and logical certainty can't be so grounded. You can't believe, uh, you can't know modus ponens or that the moral law requires universalization um, unless you can see that it has a priori grounds and understand those grounds for yourself. So I think, anyway. So why can't you have pure deference on the Kantian account? Well, he says, um, we are certain that no one will ever be able to become a true philosopher, provided that one does nothing more than imitate the philosophers of earlier times, that one leafs through or reads through their writings now and again, and that one accepts as true what they have said, and in doing so, completely forgets oneself, so to speak. If one does not trust oneself in the least, Kant suggests, one cannot have genuine philosophical knowledge or rational certainty. He says similar things about moral knowledge, particularly in the introduction of the metaphysics of morals. Um, that's where that quote that I alluded to before comes from. In general, the point is that we can't accept universal cognitions of reason on faith because with them, one can very easily err. Assertions of dogmata are thus not testimony. Instead, assertions of empirical cognitions and experiences are testimony. So if you want to translate this to the standard view, um, I think you can do that. I think basically this is the view that Kant accepts. Pure deference, deference in domains of rational certainty is inappropriate. Impure deference, deference in domains of empirical certainty is appropriate. Okay, so um, now I want to consider a couple of objections that you might have to this picture. And the first objection is um, that the role that Kant affords to testimony on this retelling really doesn't allow for true deference because true deference requires treating another as an authority. And treating another as an authority requires treating their testimony as offering what Raz called exclusionary reasons, reasons that preempt our other evidence. So we believe, when we believe when we truly defer to somebody else, right, we believe on the basis of their testimony and our other evidence is rendered inert. It doesn't 
do any work for us anymore. Okay? So, um, if Kant's view is that others' testimony is evidence on the model of our direct experience, just consider what that means. It means you take their testimony like you take your experience into your information um, and then form judgments based on uh, the weight respects in which that information favors various propositions uh, in concert with various principles. Um, but to do this is just to deny that you're taking uh, the judgments on authority. Um, so, another way to see this is just to notice that in the case of expert testimony, you can take it as evidence um, without deferring, because after all, the overall balance of the evidence might favor believing against the experts. So you think Fauci's uh, statement that we should get the vaccine, I take it as some evidence for the claim that I should get vaccinated, but I've also seen a bunch of YouTube videos or whatever, um, and so uh, I'm not going to do it, right? So, okay, so I think Kant's clear that we should still be reflective in some sense about basing our takings to be true on others say so, um, and, I, and I can see why one might think that this uh, requires not treating others as epistemic authorities. But I think Kant does have some resources to allow us to see that refusing to treat expert opinion as authoritative in certain contexts is fraught. So in particular, when we're considering our uh, grounds for belief and asking ourselves the question, could these hold universally for the determination of our reason, um, you might consider maxims like the following. To discover the truth, I'll always rely on my own judgment, by which I mean the balance of the overall reasons as I see them from my perspective, in assessing uh, my evidence and how to determine my judgment, even when I'm not knowledgeable in the empirical matters relevant to deciding some issue. Universalized, maybe this looks something like this. To discover the truth, each person will always rely on her judgment, even when she's not knowledgeable in the relevant empirical matters on some issue. I think this doesn't fail any sort of contradiction and conception test, uh, but it is unclear to me that this sort of rule is epistemically optimal. In particular, in cases where there are coordination and collective action problems, um, this looks like a bad rule for guiding our inquiry. Um, we're better off, this is quick and would require some support from an episodic point of view when we allow for the division of cognitive labor, which might include in a range of circumstances, true deference to others, um, accepting their judgments as authoritative. By contrast, the second maxim, to discover the truth that will defer to others in the sense that requires uh, treating them as authority, that I have good reason to believe are experts in the empirical matters relevant to deciding the issue, I think has no problem at all harmonizing with uh, our practical purpose in uh, inquiry, namely to discover the truth. One point is that when I authentically and autonomously judge on the basis of reflections of this kind, the deference in a certain range of cases is appropriate, an account that directs us to use our own understanding can have really little to say in objection. After all, if my judgment that deference is genuine, uh, deference is appropriate is genuine, abandoning it for the upshot of a theory like Kant's or some passages in Kant would count, it seems to me, as a failure to use my <laughs> own understanding. Um, put somewhat differently, it's not obvious that Kant's railing against lazy thinking is his way of telling us that we need merely to add others' testimony to other reasons and to form an overall judgment, taking their evidence into account. It might be that it exhibits sufficient reflectiveness to think clearly about the importance of testimony and the role of experts, uh, who after all, he says um, in the logic lectures, understand in order to be useful to others. And you might have another kind of objection, which is that this view fails to vindicate epistemic paternalism. So many aren't epistemically responsible. Um, so one of the major complaints in the wake of the pandemic is that people conducted uh, lots of their own research and came to lots of bad conclusions about what to do, putting maybe other people at risk, but even if you put that aside, uh, putting themselves at risk and uh, believing lots of false things that they could have avoided believing if they were uh, reflective in the right kind of way. Um, 
One thought, and it's a thought that has, I think, become much more plausible in the wake of events like this, is that when they do conduct themselves in this kind of way, we ought to be able to structure the information environment in ways that foreclose bad, bad options. So if you ban a bunch of YouTube channels or something like that, the idea is, um, well, then you'll have a situation in which the only information is the good information, and they might defer to experts uh, under those conditions. You hear a lot of people sort of thinking back to the days when there were just a few newscasters and a few commonly accepted sources of, of information, and oh, wasn't it so easy to build consensus and so on and so forth. Um, it would be great if we could go back, right? Um, so I just want to think really quickly in closing through three distinctions and what Kant should say about various different efforts of this kind. So the difference between hard and soft paternalism marks the difference between interventions that are anticipated to advance an agent's interest from her perspective. So consider Mill's bridge case, right? You're about to cross an unsafe bridge. I know it's unsafe. It'll collapse if you cross it. Um, if I stop you from crossing the bridge, this can seem to sit light as a tether on your freedom and autonomy. At least it seems to make you better off in a way that it would be kind of crazy to say um, considerations of autonomy were closed. Um, so, actually, Kant can say, although he doesn't say that it's freedom promoting, that um, there's no real problem with paternalistic interventions of this kind. Um, especially when there's no uh, law involved, it looks like a way of discharging one's duty of beneficence and easy rescue to do these sorts of things. Um, and so, you know, uh, that's okay, but what happens if I try to stop you uh, and you say, no, I wish to continue, it's shorter in any way, I love risk. Um, well, then you've got a case of hard control. If I continue to intervene to stop you, then it looks like um, that, that I'm intervening in a way that uh, would supplant my judgment about your own good with your own. And I think there Kant might say that there's something disrespectful about that, but in any case, he, all, he Claims about paternalistic government are not claims about uh, whether you can stop people from doing things of that sort. Both variants of Mill's bridge case, uh, bridge case notice are examples, of coercive paternalism, and yet some exercises of paternalism are not coercive. So think about things like libertarian paternalism, where you're merely changing options. So consider a case where I serve as the editor of a newspaper and I subtly arrange op-eds to elicit what I believe are more reliable judgments on some matter to ensure that readers are not misled. Um, I think there might be something kind of disrespectful about that, um, but it doesn't seem like it violates your autonomy. It's kind of like being free to um, tell you anything and leave you uh, to believe as you will. Again, I think it's hard to see Kant's having any sort of strict objection here. Um, so now consider a further case where I'm not a newspaper editor doing that sort of thing to try to promote the true and the good, but rather I am a legislator trying to tell newspaper editors uh, what information they can print uh, even if they want to. Uh, in such cases, I think the Kantian account really has to dig in its heels. Legal prohibitions of fake news and things of that nature aren't necessary to secure compossible freedom. The state lacks the authority to enact the ban, and I also think enacting the ban there imposes an alien normative constraint on other agents. Namely, you wish to publish the news article, and I say you will not. You now face a new normative constraint um, on Kant's notion of autonomy. That has to look bad. I face the same normative constraint I already faced, which was to be truthful in my communication. Maybe. Q and <laughs> So um, I think some of these reflections suggest that Kant can, for various reasons, although I think not necessarily for reasons of freedom, narrow the gulf separating these rival accounts of the individual and our place in the social world. Um, but I think there's still a gap. Um, I think, so the example of fake news, why is it on my mind? It's on my mind because Etienne Brown just published a paper arguing that autonomy provides reasons to prohibit fake news. Um, I will say just a few things because I think I'm short on time. Is this correct? Um, 
<laughs> I will say just a few things in closing in, in defense of this sort of account, which would see an issue with autonomy and prohibition to pick news. Um, over the rival that I sketched at the beginning. So the rival says, recall, there's no affront to our economy uh, when, sorry, the account that I want you to suggest says it's no affront to our economy that others communicate in ways that might lead us to act against our interests. It says that if the state were to force the issue censoring misleading information or false content, we might be better off for the exercise of force, but we would not be freer. Autonomy worth the name as a, I understand it, and as I think Kant understood it, is not a success word, or is a success word only in a limited sense. We succeed in autonomy when we have reflected on our ends and selected means to them, when we have ordered our incentives and employed our faculties actively to address certain problems, when we've set our priorities, and when we've determined uh, which constraints uh, we're going to order our lives by in facing situations. Whether the means we've taken promote or compromise those ends, whether we succeed in putting a f into effect the ordering of maxims that we endeavor to put into effect, that whether we do so in a way that befits our proper selves, these are distinct matters from questions about whether we did what we did autonomously. Now you might say, but what about positive freedom? Isn't Kant the clear, right, that we achieve this only so far as we succeed in certain of these tasks. In a way, obviously, yes, I'm not denying that. Um, when we subordinate our pursuit of happiness to our pursuit of impartial reason, we gain a kind of control over ourselves, and that matters. To put the point differently, the side of ourselves that ought to be in control really is in charge. Passions don't rip us off course. Kant is right to emphasize that this is an aspect of human freedom worth aspiring to and worth caring about. But that's a distinct matter from the matter of whether in failing to achieve this kind of freedom, which is an achievement and might be not anywhere in our world. We still act through an autonomous will. Whether we so act, it seems to me, depends on whether we have the right kind of will and on little else. If we do in fact have the right kind of will, namely an autonomous will, then at least on one level of analysis, no one can interfere with or compromise or promote our autonomy. Because what it is to say that we have autonomy is just to say that we have the right kind of will. Now the question arises, why would something then like a law prohibiting fake news or mandating consumer protections or something like that when they're hard protections uh, or paternalistic laws against drugs or things of that nature or whatever or whatever rub against us rub up against our autonomy at all. It might not promote it, but neither does it, it seem can it really remove it, because we got the will and we don't. Nobody can get it to me. Um, right, well, and yet when people declare that I'm not to be exposed to some content, that a decision I make is a legal nothing if I was, then they act in a way that's not, my, that's not respectful of my having this sort of will. They pretend that I'm to be manipulated by a bunch of people, that I can't make the determination of who to trust and who not to trust, and the means that they choose to prevent this is manipulation after their own model. My autonomy remains under either scenario, but only when uh, the speech of others is allowed to reach me for my appraisal am I really allowed to, do, uh, to decide what to do for myself. Uh, protections and solicitous concern for others is well placed when it pertains to children, but not when it pertains to adults. With adults, it is only when others are allowed to come to the marketplace with their representations that all are allowed to decide matters for their self, themselves. Since neither the speaker nor the listener deprives another of what is theirs, the person or entity doing the interfering, imposing the legal obligation, lacks the right kind of grounds for interference, namely that such interference is required. I've completely lost it. Uh, for uh, everybody's mutual independence, um, and when that interference takes the form of legislating a new obligation directed at an allegedly autonomous will, I think that want of grounds is crucial. So, um, thanks for listening. Um, I don't hope to have convinced you even that this is Konsky, let alone uh, that you should accept it if it is Konsky. 
But I'm um, looking forward to some great remarks from Kevin and to a uh, lovely concluding Q&A. So thank you. Uh, presentation for the last time uh, this weekend. Uh, thank you for having me and uh, for organizing that event, of course. Uh, in the comment just following a presentation, one usually does not have to remind the listeners of what they just heard. And that, it's not just, and that it's not just because you, JP, made your arguments very comprehensive. Uh, nevertheless, we also have got two long days of good arguments and therefore intensive discussions behind us. So let, rem let, uh, let me remind you anyway, briefly, of what we just heard by giving a very short uh, outline uh, of the paper's main points. And by giving that outline, I can in turn make clear, hopefully, my focus on a few of its arguments. <clears throat> the overarching problem of, of the paper is what to make of the concept of autonomy in the two senses of thinking and acting independently. Because acting independently, especially in the strong sense of moral autonomy, relies on certain epistemic premises, which, judged on your own, can be misleading. But relying on the judgment of experts or authorities, instead, can be just as misleading, or even conflicting, because relying on other judgments undermines the epistemic autonomy I seek to realize in my actions. The discussed problems, like moral and epistemic uh, deference, journalism and democratic self-government, are specific problems of this conflict. Discussing these specific problems, the paper drives two points, the first of which aims to soften the somewhat strict consequences of Kant's concept of moral autonomy, while the second tries to motivate this rather subtle autonomy by raising questions from the standpoint of political freedom. I want to take a closer look at the discussion of deference, uh, sorry, deference and raise some questions in reference to its exegetical basis. The initial point of uh, deference is lack of information. By lacking either rational or empirical information, we defer to the judgments of others insofar as they are considered experts in the realm of matters. There are at least two ways in which we can learn from experts, either by sucking their book's content up like a sponge or picking up the book and scrutinizing it. For Kant, the first option is ruled out, because imitating another person's thought is nothing else than a mindless copy of his or her judgment. Nevertheless, in the Critique of Judgment, Kant states that, quote, there is no use of our powers, however free, no use of reason itself, which would not give rise to faulty attempts if others had not preceded him with their attempts. So we might just as well say that the old mathematicians prove that our reason is only imitative. End quote. But how is, say, determining the upward force of a floating object by using Archimedes' method, method an imitation of Archimedes, that is, a rational uh, deference to him, rather than having an original <coughs> knowledge of how to use his method? The paper states that a solution to this problem is a healthy understanding which is capable of seeing good reasons as stemming from its own capacity for self-legislation. In this case, we can consider Archimedes an expert mathematician only if his method makes it comprehensive that an upward force of an object can indeed be calculated by his method. If a friend asks for help calculating an upward force and I tell her to take a bath and say Eureka, I didn't understand Archimedes' experiment and she will only imitate. If I tell her instead that the floating object will displace just as much water as there is outside of the bathtub, she can apply the method correctly and independently. Only in the latter case, we have a good reason to defer to Archimedes as an epistemic authority. It is just this process of finding the same evidence for a claim which makes the imitated thought an original one, that is by comprehending autonomously the very same thought the author presented authoritatively in the first place. This argument can be derived from Kant's own conclusion that, quote, following, nachfolge, involving something precedent, not imitation, is the right expression for all influence that the products of an exemplary author may have on others. 
And this only means that we draw from the same sources as our predecessor did. End quote. So if, as Kant states, deriving arguments from the same sources as epistemic authorities makes their judgments exemplary, one could argue that exemplarity is a discriminating quality of a judgment one can defer to. Therefore, if the paper states that the main problem of philosophical expertise concerns the lack of clear ways of identifying these experts, exemplarity can be a fruitful concept uh, to work with. And of course, that uh, touches, the, touches the problem of testimony as well, I think. This argument for epistemic exemplarity can also act as a starting point for a deeper discussion of moral exemplarity, which is strongly connected to the softened concept of a liberal paternalism. Moral exemplarity maybe even rehabilitates imitation to a certain degree. In the Doctrine of Virtue, Kant states that the means for internalizing moral behavior, quote, is good example on the part of the teacher, his, ex his exemplary conduct, and that for a still undeveloped human being, imitation is the first determination of his will to accept maxims that he afterwards makes for himself. In this case, it is not an argument or a judgment which qualifies as, as exemplary, but a certain behavior itself. Nevertheless, this is another case in which uh, deference to an authority, even in the strong sense of imitation, is not contrary, but a premise of comprehending the same rational sources on which moral authority is grounded in the first place. I think the concept of exemplarity is not only of exegetical interest, but also provides some philosophical aspects to the paper's second question of a soft deference's political impact. This is because exemplarity is not an a priori quality of thought, a judgment, or a book, but rather a shared notion of an ideal shaped by what Kant calls the sensus communis. The sensus communis is a process of active discussion of judgments, a marketplace of ideas, a marketplace of ideas, and is contrary to the sensus privatus, which translates as the discussed logical egoism. Qualifying, uh, uh, sorry, qualifying as exemplary is therefore no individual task. It requires a process of reciprocal restriction of judgments, and within this process, the judgment broadens its evidential value if it compensates different views on the discussed matter. And at the end of this idealized peer review process, the judgment can claim universality only if it reflects on the intersections of formally contrary views. The judgment can become and remain an epistemic authority only in so far as it is subject to an ongoing critique within the marketplace of ideas. It is prominently uh, argued by Hanal especially that this critical communication establishes a public and independent thinking which acts as a prototype of political autonomy. These arguments press the point that the willingness to reconsider assumptions and the expectation of agreement brings upon a relational autonomy. Jumping to a conclusion, one could ask, doesn't this process of agreement qualify as a democratic grassroots procedure of self-government? In accordance with this view, Kant states, quote, but what a people is not able to legislate over itself, a monarch is even less entitled to decree. For his legislative standing is based precisely on the fact that he unifies in his will the collective will of the people." End quote. I am not fully convinced by the arguments that this deliberative procedure can be called democratic in the full sense of the self-legislation, but provided that the procedure at least is an instrument which promotes an equal say in the democratic discourse, and the authority's will should represent the citizen's will, the, deliber the deliberative procedure can at least predetermine governmental decision making. Because if the deliberative procedure guarantees an equal say, at least ideally, members of the political discussion can shape the course of legislation that apply to them. So in my interpretation, the sensus communis cannot constitute positive law, but has a negative and restricting influence on the authorities' will. Now, in my comment, I mainly put forward the two concepts of exemplarity and sensus communis. 
I think they not only provide a far-reaching ex exegetical basis, but also are useful analytical instruments to discuss Kant's neurologic arguments and epistemic authority and autonomy further. So thank you again for your paper, and uh, I hope I, give, I could give a few pointers to get the discussion started. Thank you.